So we are going to be tackling the most interesting book of the Bible. How many of you are excited? Say amen. amen. It's Leviticus. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Goat sacrifices. Yeah. We get a t-shirt. It says we sacrifice goats. No, I'm not going to do that. <laughs> We're not going to do that. <laughs> Don't do that. I've said that from the platform before, and somebody actually go make their own shirt. Don't make your own shirt, all right? But we are going to be talking about Leviticus because there's a really important thing that's happening in Leviticus, and this is where God is starting to set up some structure. And the structure that God is setting up is really important because he is setting up the, the, the festivals, and he is setting up the sacrificial laws on this is how you pay for sin, this is how this gets taken care of. And I'm just going to tell you this. You go, yeah, that's Old Testament. Listen really closely to me. You and I needed a way to pay for sin. So as much as maybe the practice that we see in the Old Testament is Old Testament, the principle never changed. We needed something to take care of sin. And so we see it started in the Old Testament. We actually see that God is the very first person who ever performs a sacrifice we see it in the garden where adam and eve you guys know the story with the fruit and there they are and adam took the fruit and gave her husband to eat and adam blamed eve for the whole mess this woman that you gave me just in case you forgot how that all went down and then it says that they were naked and they saw themselves and they were ashamed but then interestingly enough the very next few verses tell us that god clothed them and animal skins. And there's only one way to get animal skins. That's to sacrifice. See, God was setting up a principle even then that without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin, no forgiveness of sin. There had to be a price paid. See, all this sounds pretty morbid, Vince. We'll get there. Hang on just a second. And so from there, we move on from that season up into the Levitical law, where the, the Levites, that's where Leviticus comes from, it, the Levites, the priests who were in charge of making sure all this went well. And I'm just going to tell you, thank God I'm not a Levitical priest. Because basically how that would happen in those days is if you went into the Holy of Holies to be able to prepare sacrifice, I would have done it with a rope and a bell on my clothes. And that rope and the bell, as I would have walked in there, had there been anything in my heart, in my life, in my mind, between me and God, the moment I would have got in the presence, I'd have fell over dead, the bell would have started ringing, and you would have stopped ringing, and you would have known to drag me out by the rope. How many of you are thankful that's not how we have to go to God now? <laughs> yeah. But I will tell you what we've done is that God is the same God. He's just as holy as he's always been. And I believe we've fallen into the trap of not being as reverent as we once were. And so when we talk about this holiness, we have to start someplace. And, and I want to kind of walk through this because here was the, here was the whole premise of the book of Leviticus. It's simply this. The central message of Leviticus is that God is holy and that he requires his people to be holy. The book also shows that God graciously provides atonement for sin through the shedding of blood. Okay, now, for those of you that are New Testament lovers and you love Jesus and you love grace and you love mercy, me too. But it all came from someplace. Jesus only executed God's perfect plan. And so to understand the plan, you have to go backwards some. And so we're going to just kind of go back today. We're going to talk through a simple, simple thing. I say it's a simple thing. It's probably been the hardest sermon that I've had to put together simply because I don't know that I'm worthy enough to preach it. And today's sermon is on the holy topic of sin. How many of you are good at sin? Say amen. amen. How many of you nailed it this morning in some way, shape, or form? How many of you are just planning on after church getting it out of the way? <laughs> so, okay, sorry. Right. If you're planning it, we need to talk, all right? <laughs> There's intent with that. But uh, 
I want to give you just some passages that we recognize, and then I want to walk through some definitions of sin, and we're going to, we're going to get into the two kinds of sin found in the Bible. And so here we go. The first scripture I want to give you is Romans chapter 3, verse 23. Very popular scripture. This is what is kind of the beginning of Romans Road. If you, if you, ever, if you grew up in church, you maybe heard the Romans Road to Salvation. And the reason they use Romans is because Paul is trying to describe to a people group that did not have God in their history. They had gods in their history. And none of them were a redemptive God. Their gods were to show strength and power, not redemption and forgiveness. And so Paul is writing to the Romans going, let me walk you through this idea of the gospel, the saving grace of Jesus Christ, so that you understand what we're talking about. And he starts off with this passage in Romans chapter 3, verse 23, that says this, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Church, who has sinned? All. all of us have. Every one of us. And again, most of us are good at it. It comes more natural to us than anything else. If you don't believe me, walk into a home with a toddler. Amen. How many of you know you don't have to train a toddler to be evil? Listen, if you're that parent that's like, my kid's so sweet, <laughs> it's coming. They're tricking you right now. They're just bringing you in. And then they're going to color on your wall. Right? That's what they're going to do. They don't have to think about it. You don't even have to tell a kid to not share. They just know it. They just know this is mine. They're selfish they don't let you sleep at night. Right? If they had any consideration for me, they would sleep. They don't. The Bible says we're born into this evil. It's a nature, sin nature that we have. It's easier for us to be bad than it is to choose to be good and actually follow through with it. And I know some of you are like, no, I, no. listen, it's just real. You may have been able to figure out a way to control your actions, but some of those thoughts you have are evil. And so we have to understand, this is, the, this is the starting point that Paul takes him to in Romans, but it's also the starting point in the Levitical law where he says, listen, we have to address sin. If we don't address sin, then there's always going to be an issue. Why? Because God... By his own description in scripture, God cannot look upon sin. Did you know this, Joe? That God can't see sin. In other words, if you are living with sin in your life, God cannot see you. He smells you. Biblical truth. For God cannot look upon sin, but the sin in your life is an aroma, a stench. Not my word, but it's a stench that rises up into the nostrils of God. So it, he can't look upon you, but he can smell you. That's intense, right? I don't want, I don't, I don't, I don't know about you, but the more I think about that, I want God to be able to see me at all times. How many of you need that in your life? I need him to see me. I'm glad he knows I'm there, but I really want to know he can see me. Which means I constantly have to be in this battle with the sin that's there. And so we see this passage, this idea that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Okay, so Pastor Vince, what does a sin mean? I need a definition of what sin is. I'll give it to you. Sin is a willful transgression of a known law of God. In other words, if you have a Bible and God says don't do it, and you do it, it's sin. If God says, do it, and you don't do it, it's sin. It's not a circumstantial moment. It's not an accident. It wasn't, a, it wasn't an attitude. It wasn't, a, uh, it wasn't something that was by mistake. It was, it was a sin. It wasn't your personality type. It wasn't your short temper. It was a sin. So Vince, that seems extreme. Oh, it gets way more extreme. So in the Old Testament, there was a word for sin called chata. Chata is, a, is an archery term. It simply means to miss the mark. But even we have expanded the mark. How many of you have ever shot at a target before? And realized that there's rings outside the target, right? You got, the, you got these outer rings and you get all the way down to the middle and the middle is called the what? 
the bullseye. According to this word, chata means if you don't hit the bullseye, it's sin. It's like, I'm going to give you some uh, really horrible theology right now. Ricky Bobby said, <laughs> if you ain't first, say I don't feel as guilty because all of you have seen it too. If, if, if you don't hit the bullseye, it's sin. Yeah, but Vince, I was really close to the bullseye. Sin. I mean, but I had a bad day. Sin. I'm just going to tell you, this sermon doesn't get any more comfortable than it is right now. It didn't for me while I was walking through it. Because how many of you grew up, I'm going to show my age here. How many of you grew up in the only channel, like one of the only channels you had was Channel 9 WGN out of Chicago? And you got to watch Cubs baseball? Which I think was probably hypnotism. That's why there's so many Cubs fans in the South. It doesn't make sense at all. But then there was another show on that was my favorite show. It was the Bozo Show. And on the Bozo Show, at the end of the Bozo Show, every day, they played a game called the Grand Prize Game. How many of you know what I'm talking about, the Grand Prize Game? If you don't know what I'm talking about, the Grand Prize Game was six buckets and some ping pong balls. That was it. That was all it was. Six buckets lined up in a row and ping pong balls. And at the end of that, the sixth bucket, it was the same prize every week. You got a brand new Huffy bicycle from whatever store that was sponsoring it that week. But you got a bicycle at the end of it. Now here's the thing. They'd start right here, and here'd be the first bucket. And the band would be back here playing, and they'd drop the ball in the bucket. Ta-da! Like, man, killed it. Woo! It's four inches away from them. But they're losing their mind celebrating because they got the first bucket. Second bucket, third bucket, four, all the way out to the sixth bucket. If you got the ping pong ball in all the buckets, including the sixth bucket, then you got the bicycle. And it was a good day when anyone won the bicycle. It was a bad day when that seven-year-old is up there throwing ping-pong balls and they miss on the second bucket. And you know, like, what we would do now, right? We'd be like, give them another bike! It's fine. We don't want to crush them. Not Bozo. (laughs) No, no, no. Bozo said, you didn't get in all the buckets, you ain't getting a bike. You can get it all the way up to the fifth bucket, but if you don't hit the sixth bucket, you're not getting the bike. And that was just the truth. That was the way the game was played. How many of you, under, how many of you remember that, 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 that day and age when that was just the, the, this was the rule and that's what it is? Some of you are teachers right now. I grew up when I was, when I was in school that you, you were given an assignment. And then when you were given an assignment, you turned it in at a specific time. And if you didn't turn it in at a specific time, it was just a zero. Right? How many of you remember that? And now I've had this conversation with my boys. This literal conversation with my kids. And I go, hey, you didn't turn these assignments in. Oh, I know, I'll turn them in later. No, 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 no. I see the sheet and it says it was due on this day and it is way past that day. I know, but it's cool. I can turn it in. I can just make it up. I'm like, no, you can't. Can you? They're like, yeah, it's fine. They'll take it late. I'm like, they take it late? Yeah, they take it late. Then I'm mad because of where I grew up. They didn't take it late. I said, to deal with it, I had to walk into my dad's with my bottom lip quivering. How many of you remember that conversation? Because I couldn't, I couldn't turn it in late. So I had to set a new rule. I'm like, I don't care if they'll take it late. I'm not going to take it late. I'll run my own grading scale on you. <laughs> if it's late, it's a zero. Dad, that's not fair. Yes, it is. That's actually how it's supposed to work. What's not fair is that the educator's got to keep waiting on you. That's not fair. I figured I'd get an amen from a teacher on that. So, yeah, okay, teacher's up here going... <laughs> but we've done the same thing with sin in our society. We assume that because of the grace of God, we don't have to hit any of the buckets and we're still going to get the bike. We don't have to turn in any of the assignments and we're still going to get heaven. For all have fallen short, all have missed the mark. The New Testament definition 
of sin is hamartia. Hamartia. And the Greeks, they were a little more theatrical, a little more athletic based. And this was their description. It's a fatal flaw that brings about the downfall of the hero of a tragedy. I want you to notice the absolute in the definitions. Chata, to miss. That's an absolute. If you were trying to hit something and you missed it, you didn't almost hit it, you missed it. Am I right? How many of you told the story? Almost got that deer. But you did it. Man, I had that fish right up next to the boat. Some of you are convicted right now. (laughs) You're thinking of all the times now you have to repent. (laughs) But you didn't. You missed. You missed. The Greek definition, it doesn't just say it's a flaw. Go ahead and put that back up there. It doesn't say it's a flaw. What kind of flaw is it? That's pretty absolute. This flaw will kill you. That's how, that's how severe this is. That's how heavy sin is. That's why this matters to you and I as believers. It's because we need to address sin as it truly is. Something that has an absolute consequence. But Jesus, hang on. Hang on. We've got to get through our cultural mud first. All right, Because the Bible hasn't changed even though culture has. And what culture attempts to do is it takes the Bible and it tries to fan the pages of the Bible and then slide pieces of culture into the pages as the Bible fans. That's not how the Bible works. The Bible was written to be a living book. It still means now what it meant then. It still will speak to your heart and convict your heart and challenge your heart if you will allow it to. The problem is we allow culture and decisions and voices and people to maybe get into our definitions of what the Bible is trying to say to us. And it's sin. The Bible says very clearly, you shall not add to it and you shall not take away from it. So this part of the Bible, we have to take. We have to take it. And so what we see here is these two definitions of sin, and we walk through this reality that sin is fatal. Sin is just missing. It doesn't mean missing a lot. It just means if you miss, it is sin. So here's the tough part, that if God is holy and expects us to be holy, what does that mean? Perfection. How many of you have missed perfection? Yeah. That's why it says, all have sinned and fallen short of this. So Pastor Vince, if, if God expects perfection, I'm already out. This is going to be the most depressing sermon I've ever heard in my life. What, do I, what chance do I have? Again, we have to work through the definition because there's some myths. There's some myths about sin, but I want to give you this idea. I want to give you the biblical perspective of sin because, again, we add to it or we take away from it. Here's what James says about sin. For whoever... Whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become guilty of it all. What? Pastor Vince, I have yet to murder anybody. I have not murdered, I have not killed anybody. I haven't committed adultery, I haven't committed murder. I I mean, those two I know I haven't done. The rest of them, a little shady. You chuckle, but how many of you have ever put something before God? How many of you have ever not honored your father and mother? How many of you have not honored the Lord's day and kept it holy? How many of you have ever taken God's name in vain? See, we keep bringing out the big ones like murder and adultery because those are tangible ones that we can actually say, I didn't do it. But the other eight, just in the list of 10, and Leviticus goes a lot farther than the list of 10. We have to answer for it. And what James says in the New Testament is that there's no scale here. Yeah, but I think there should be. I know, and that's a myth of sin. So let's get into some of these myths, all right? Because there are three myths that I want to walk through, and there's actually a fourth one. But the first myth is this, comparative sin. So long as I'm not as bad as some other people I know, I'm good. How many of you got a crazy friend? Say amen. 
Like their entire life is a train wreck. Right? I mean, they, the decisions they make are a train wreck. Their relationships are a train wreck. Their finances are a train wreck. And sometimes you're like, it's good that I got that person around because I feel a lot better about me because that person's around. You're like, that's, that's not really how I am until you are. Comparative sin is destroying us as a, as a people, as the children of Christ where we begin to look and go, well, because I'm not doing what Joe's doing and Joe's not doing what Logan is doing, we can all justify what we personally are doing because it doesn't compare to that. And so I'm good. I can justify it. And that, that's a toxic place to be, that myth of comparative sin. The second myth is this, collateral damage sin. If I'm not hurting anyone else, then I'm fine. As long as the sin I'm choosing doesn't hurt you, then what is it really anyone's business? I mean, it's, it's just inward, and me and God will handle that. We'll deal with that in time. I'll deal with that when I'm ready. When I'm emotionally ready, when I'm physically ready, when I'm spiritually ready, God will address that with me. No, God addresses it with you the moment it hits your mind. question is, are you dealing with it the moment it hits your mind, or are you pushing it off? And saying, well, I don't know. I just got really mad. That's a secondary emotion. You can control that. No, I can't, Pastor Benz. I'm Irish. I don't care if you're a monkey. <laughs> okay, listen. Your heritage does not make you a jerk. Your attitude does. The color of your hair, redheads. I know the stigma you get. Any redheads in the house? Got a few. I know the stigma. It's not fair. If you are cranky, it's because you're choosing to be cranky, not because your hair is red. So don't blame it on their hairstyle. Blame it on them specifically. Point it right at them. You're being cranky. All right? We, we do this constantly with stuff. We compare, we, we, we say it's just my thing, it's my issue that I'm dealing with. Your issue that you're dealing with will ultimately affect people. Because sin, there's an old song that says sin will take you farther than you want to go. And it will lead you down a path you didn't want to go down and it will take you farther down that path than you ever thought imaginable. Like, it would blow your mind to know where sin has taken some people. And you go, yeah, but, but as long as they're dealing with it, we can't deal with it. It's not in us to deal with it. We're, we'll get to that in just a second. But you have to stop with the collateral damage justification of saying, well, this is, as long as I'm not hurting anybody else, you will ultimately hurt somebody else with your private sin. It will happen. So you've got comparative sin, you've got collateral damage sin, and you've got the, the most famous, and that's comfortable sin, where we've grown so accustomed to this thing being part of our lives, we just dismiss it as nothing. We just dismiss it as nothing. Well, the Lord knows what to deal with. Yeah, he does, and he reminds you every time you deal with it to fix it. And you keep pushing it off, you keep pushing it off, you keep pushing it off. I'm going to give you a scripture here in a second that ought to curl your hair. But it's in the Bible, and people don't like that it's in the Bible, because it's pretty direct. Fourth myth is the grace myth, the Christian myth, is that grace excuses it all. Whoa, 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 Pastor, whoa, Pastor Vince. That's the truth. Nope. That's a myth. Since that, room gets real still. Especially when you take away the biggest excuse we have. Let me clarify. Does the grace of God forgive you of your sins? Yes. 100%. Does the grace of God eliminate the consequences of the sin in your life? Yes. Praise Jesus, it does. Is the grace of God an excuse for your sin? No. Absolutely not. That is an abuse of grace, and you should be ashamed. 
Here's what the Bible says in Hebrews. For him that has tasted the heavenly gift and been a partaker of the Spirit of God. For him to sin willfully after the knowledge of God, there remains no more sacrifice for his sin. Did you know that was in there? A lot of people don't know that one's in there. We, they don't put that one on a coffee cup. That one doesn't go on your February calendar because it's an intense, it's a weighty scripture. And it's for those that continually use the grace of God as an excuse. I repeated a prayer when I was 12, so I get to go do what I want because I get to go to heaven. Why? Because God's grace covers it all. No, what you mean is God's grace excuses all of your activity. And that is abuse. That's abuse. It's neglect of what the gospel and what the grace of Jesus Christ truly is. And so don't fall into that myth, church. Please don't fall into that myth because we've seen it. That's when a church becomes comfortable and becomes stagnant and becomes what we see a lot of American churches becoming now where we can just come in and we get the good message where we feel good when we leave. We high five each other on the way to the restaurant and we don't think about it Monday or Tuesday. It's because we've stopped looking at sin as sin and we've stopped dealing with it with repentance and saying, Lord, I have sin in my life. I don't have a mistake in my life. I don't have a bad decision. I have sin in my life and you can't see me with sin in my life. Isaiah says it this way, God's hand is not short that he cannot save. Nor is his ear turned, we cannot hear you, but your sin has separated you from God where he will not Hear your cry. God won't hear my cry. Not until you deal with the sin. Again, not a coffee cup scripture. That one's got weight to it. It's got weight to it. So what do we do? Well, we've got to address the two types of sin. There's only two in all of scripture. And I'll get through this pretty quick. Two types of sin of this. First one is this. The sin of commission. The sin of commission is simply this. What are you doing that you know you should not be doing? Let's just ask. You don't, have to, you don't have to be involved in this if you don't want to, but how many of you right now know there is something in your life that you ought not be doing, but you are doing You're not alone. I'm going to give you the most confusing section of scripture in all of the Bible. I'm pretty sure Paul was in the midst of a nervous breakdown when he was trying to write this. Believe me, as I start reading it, you're going to have to lean in because I had to read it two or three times because Paul is trying to explain again to Romans who don't understand a redemption arc, who don't understand Jesus Christ and the sacrifice made, who don't understand that stuff. He's trying to explain it to them and and how he wrestles with it still. And so this is where Paul goes. Romans chapter 7, verse 15. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want. But I do the very thing that I hate. Anybody with Paul so far? Now, verse 16. If I do what I do not want, then I'm good with the law. I'm good with the law. That is good. Because see, nature in me wants to do bad. So if I don't do bad and I do what I don't want to do, then it's good. I told you, he's not done with his breakdown. Verse 17. So now it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells in me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me, that is in my flesh, For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I keep on doing. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I who do it, but the sin, he says it again, that dwells within me. 
Paul's going, listen, there is a nature in you that it will be far, far, far easier for you to live in sin than to live for Christ. It is there, and it will be a daily, a daily discipleship battle. It's a day, Christians, listen to me. It is a daily discipleship battle to stay in the will of God, to stay in the favor of God. Not that God doesn't love you, not that his grace isn't sufficient, but staying in the favor and in the will of God are different than being saved. He says, and I struggle with, Paul says, I struggle with it every day. So how do you fix the sin of commission? You have to replace some things. Paul says, it is the sin that dwells in me that's causing this. This flesh part of me, the man that I listen to more than anybody else, me. The inner me. How many of you know that the inner me is sometimes the biggest enemy? And that's what Paul is saying here. This inner flesh me. It's where this struggle comes from. But by the time he writes to Galatians, Paul changes his words around a little bit. And Paul says, I figured it out, though. I figured out how to handle it. I figured out how to remedy the sin of commission. He says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. You see the flip? He had to replace He had to replace that flesh with Christ. He had to replace that sin with Jesus, with the grace, with the mercy, with the spirit of God, so that when those moments came up that he had opportunity to sin, he would choose Jesus. He would choose Jesus. He had to make a choice that said, God, Lord, he said it on the Damascus road, Lord. There was a replacing that took place. And it's daily. God, I die to myself today. I die to myself today. Jesus said it this way. Daily you pick up your cross and follow me. That's how you get over the sin of commission. Second sin. It's the sin of omission. Those things you ought to do. You just choose not to. And let me tell you as your pastor, I'm with you on this one. I'm known by enough people that I pretty much know what not to do as a representative of Jesus Christ. But there are a lot of times in my life where Jesus has told me exactly what to do, and I just didn't, because no one would know. No one would know. The Bible says in James, for whosoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, it's sin. Wait a a minute. No, I know the bad stuff is sin. No, the not doing the good stuff is sin too. The not doing the good stuff is just as much sin. Remember the first scripture, James chapter 2. If you have failed in one part of the law, you are guilty of all of it. Whether it's the sin of commission or the sin of omission, here's the reality of what's happening. He says, if you know to do it and you don't, what did the kingdom benefit? And this happens to me every day. Church, every day God tells me to speak to somebody about Jesus. Every day. I get the nudge of my back, heart, what, how, I don't know how he speaks to you, I know how he speaks to me, I'll be at a checkout, I'll be pumping gas, uh, and it'll be like, right now, go, go, I'm like, I don't want to go, say something, I don't want to say anything, I don't, know where to, I don't know where to start the conversation, I don't care, just start the conversation, Vince, I don't want to, I'll get it later, I'll get the next one, and hey, listen, am I alone in it? God, I, God, I don't, I don't want, I don't want, God, I don't want to, I don't feel like it right now. God, I'm exhausted, I'm tired, I'm a little cranky, and I don't know that they're going to like the Jesus that comes out of me. And then he reminds me, that would be you, that won't be Jesus. I'm telling you to speak to them about me. Vince, if you'll trust me, it might change your mood. It might change your mood if you talk about me. 
instead of being focused on how grumpy you are, how ticked off at the world you are, how bummed out that this didn't work out for you, that the hogs lost yesterday. I don't know what to, I'm just going to be. Whatever it is, I don't, I, I don't know. I just know me. And I know that this is the part that I, I don't give to God well enough. I found a scripture this week, and that's amazing to me. This is what I was talking about when I said the Bible is a living book. I've been pastoring for 21 years now. Kaylee was two months old when I took my first pastorate. And this passage in Hebrews is kind of like God just kind of peeled the tape off of it for me to see it for the first time. In Hebrews, it says this, therefore he is the mediator of a new covenant. A new covenant. What that means, I want to clarify. It means there's a new promise. It doesn't mean the process changed. We all want the process to change. That there doesn't have to be sacrifice. That there doesn't have to be... No, the promise changed. See, initially, the promise was that your sins could be forgiven. The new promise said you will have eternal life in Christ. There's a new covenant. And in this new covenant, he's the mediator of this new covenant so that those who are what, church? Called. That's us. If you're a believer, that's you. Those of us who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. How? Since a death occurred. This is the New Testament. I can take you to Leviticus and show you the same passage that says in order for there to be Redemption of sin, a death must occur. The process hasn't changed. So in order for you to deal with sin, guess what? A death had to occur. And it's what gives you the ability to deal with the sin in your life since you and I don't have the ability on our own. Those things I know to do, I don't do them. Those things I don't want to do, I do them. And yet it is a sin that lives within me. And I battle with this sin within me all the time on doing the right thing and not doing the wrong thing. And God, I, it's just this flesh that is constantly in battle, this sin that is within me. But I have been crucified with Christ. And it is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives within me. The death occurred so that I have that promise that I can win over sin. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Pastor Vince, how do I win if all of us have sinned? If I'm sitting here in my sin, how is it that I win? Remember what I told you about Romans? I'm going to just walk you through a couple pieces of it. Romans chapter 3 says, for all have sinned. I love the way Paul does this. He brings us all together. He says, all of us have sinned and we've fallen short of God's glory. So I'm a sinner? Yeah. Yeah, you're a sinner. You flip the page one time in Romans and you get to another passage that says, but in that, while you and I were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You see, he paid the price for us. And so what do I do? You turn the page one more time and it says, if If you will confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that that Jesus Christ did die for you, you shall be saved. It's that simple. But God, what about my sin? Yeah. You confess that you're a sinner who needs a Savior. I am a sinner. I am a sinner. It's not just a bad attitude. It's not just a bad day. It's not just a bad choice. It wasn't just a bad circumstance. I have sin. And the only way to deal with sin is through a Savior. And the only Savior that's fit to deal with sin is one who has sacrificed. And we have that Savior. And his name is Jesus Christ.